Happy New Year, everybody. Welcome back. This is our first video of 2024. I hope you've had a nice rest over Christmas and New Year, Marlene. Uh, not bad. Yeah, not bad. Got some nice got some nice presents, but I wasn't away anywhere, actually. I wouldn't mind going off for a wee holiday somewhere. But in the meantime, I have just booked myself um, a ticket to go and see Leslie Riddick's new film, Denmark, A State of Happiness. I'm seeing it down in, in Greenock, actually. But you've seen it already, haven't you? I have. I saw it in Stirling a few weeks ago now. And because Leslie is now in the middle of a tour of Scotland and she's doing a whole load of events, Q&As and showings of the film. If you haven't already got your tickets, we'll put the link below that tells you the dates and where you can get them. We've got a treat for you now. We've actually got a, an interview with Leslie talking about the film. But first, let's just have a little taster. This is from Denmark, The State of Happiness. Obviously, for idealistic reasons, you want your people of a country to be happy. But also for rational reasons, I mean, a happy country is a country that's less sick, that's more productive, that's got less conflict. There's so many positive things to say about that. And of course, it's all a circle, because if you're not happy and you don't have a lot of trust, uh, social capital in society, then you're not able or willing to pay that much in tax. And if you don't pay that much in tax, you're not able to uh, have this welfare state. And then, so you see, it's all interconnected. Uh, welcome everyone. We're back to Scottish Independence Podcast. And as you can see, we're sitting here with Leslie Ridder with us. Welcome into the online studio, Leslie. Thank you. We, we know you're in the midst of promoting the latest of your films, sort of Nordic series films. This one's latest one's about Denmark. And we also know, well, in fact, if you look along the bottom of the screen, folks, you'll see all the upcoming events that are happening over the next the next month or so. There's a film about pharaohs there's iceland there's uh norway estonia and this is now fifth in that sort of nordic series do you want to tell us a bit about um what it was like um doing it and you know was there anything about denmark that particularly struck you and or something that we should be doing here in scotland but you know how did it how did it go oh, yes <laughs> um, well the, the the interesting thing about denmark in a way that's different to the other countries is that it didn't become independent you know denmark was the mothership it was mm -hmm. if you like you know these are broad broad brush analogies but denmark was the england <laughs> of the peace you know i mean it's astonishing actually that for such a small country but of course a, a pivotally located country because the, the islands of denmark it is an island nation and those islands straddle the katagat and skagarak straits yeah. that are they way into the baltic and when life was all marine if you like and it was all at sea <laughs> um our geography our politics our trade everything was different so Denmark really was in pole position and could charge a Jew actually on any ship that went in and out which was a huge kind of advantage so back in the day Denmark actually owned I mean it's unbelievable the size of small Denmark and the clout that it had and of course for those people who have uh, watched Vikings and watched the last kingdom on the TV and so on they'll know that England was run by Danes for almost 200 years Dane law stretched from London to Chester mm -hmm. um, not just that I mean that's the most striking part of it but uh, Denmark also ran Norway Sweden Finland um, Estonia for a while, northern part of Germany, Iceland, Greenland, which became, Iceland became independent, the Faroes. You know, it was one of these countries that basically ran practically everything around it and it lost the lot. Now, the point of that is, and that's where the interest, I think, for us comes in, is that rather than, you know, you can think of an analogy with another country that we're actually sitting in here, you know, Britain and another part of this country, viz England, that seems unable to come to terms with the loss of empire. And yet Denmark lost in proportional terms, it lost, you know, probably two, three, four times its body weight, if you like, in terms of land right around it. And actually, 
kind of almost that focused Denmark's attention far more on developing what it had got. Uh, and it made the most of that. It didn't look backwards with kind of nostalgia. It didn't get, you know, it couldn't get hoity-toity because it was such a small country. And it's managed to kind of progress in ways, which now means that it's regularly, I mean, it's, I think, the most energy secure country in the OECD. Its GDP is regularly a third higher than Britain. Um, it has a, a more literate uh, population. And of course, it has regularly, it, it tops the poll for having the happiest people in the world, yeah. which is really we don't have, <laughs> you know, so that's the sort of backdrop that would mean a Scot should want to look at and Denmark and think, wow, you know, there's a country that's really experienced a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. What really struck me, I saw the uh, the Sterling showing, which I think was the first one that you'd you'd done, and we watched this film, and at the end, when the credits started to roll, there was a moment of just quiet, and then people started to applaud. And I think it was almost as if we were all going, whoa, <laughs> just what have we just seen? And I was actually nearly in tears at that point. I could feel my, my eyes are welling up. And it was partly not just because what a lovely, you know, their education system, how they care for their, bring their children up. And, you know, the, the emphasis on cooperation and relationship building was wonderful to see. But part of me was just, that should be us. And it was that sheer frustration and actually a, quite a sense of being cheated out of something that should be ours. I mean, what, what kind of responses are you getting to the, the, the shows that you've seen? That's exactly what everybody is saying. <laughs> um, and I mean, in that respect, it, it's not so different from the other films because they all show potential of, you know, of small countries with less going for them fundamentally than Scotland that has just managed to get the show on the road through a yeah. number of different things but mostly by trusting its own people far more than we do in Britain and thus in Scotland, because we've just done many me up till now. We've mm. imported so much of a really destructive top-down outlook and a sort of feudal outlook that Britain has and kind of put a kilt on it and not really tackled some of the stuff you need to tackle to harness your population's energy. And that would yeah. be having really genuine local democracy, which is yeah. true for all the Nordics. If you just take one example, we don't spend a lot of time. It's just a very quick moment where we look at uh, Vestas, the company. I can't remember the proportion of the world's turbines that it produces. I think it's between a quarter and a third. Now, Denmark has a much worse wind take than Scotland, as in you get less out of the wind than you would in, in the north of Scotland which is practically one of the most windy places actually in the Northern Hemisphere. And yet the Danes cornered the market uh, in wind turbines because they took a political decision early doors in the 1970s. And because they had um, a collaborative proportional parliament, that decision was taken collectively, not by one party that then got beaten and ushered in the other guys coming in who just undid everything the first mm -hmm. lot had done. And they stuck with that policy of, of, of going for wind for 50 years um, with totally changing, ever-changing coalitions of government. But because there had been agreement um, uh, with the previous government, those coalition agreements held even though the members of the coalitions changed over time. So anyway, that sounds complicated. The net of it is that Denmark has been made investable because it has a continuing outlook that it can deliver on when it comes to energy in a way that Britain, I mean, good grief, all it takes is one by-election result for the Tories to suddenly change um, energy policy completely. And everyone here, okay, we know that's rubbish, but we've sort of got used to it. In Denmark, they've got to used to precisely the opposite, which is this, this commitment to Vestas. Now, it sort of breaks my heart because Vestas was the product of a couple of engineers in the 70s, you know, long-haired hippies who just decided they had a different idea. Um, and it, meanwhile, in Scotland, another guy, Gordon Proven, who lived down the coast in Ayrshire, had a similar sort of moment of epiphany, produced small wind turbines on the same scale as the Vestas guys at the beginning. 
And Gordon's windmills, I mean, they're still around the place, but they got nowhere. Whereas Vesta's were scaled up to become a massive company in Denmark, um, employing thousands of people still. And it's that difference when you come back to that feeling of regret and that we've been, we've missed something. I mean, it's tangible what we've missed. Yeah, it yeah. is. And it, it's also, I think, the sense of everybody working for the good of the country of uh, in Denmark. You know, they're all, they might have different perspectives on all sorts of things, but at the end of the day, they're all trying to do the best for their country. And that's why they're working together. And then you look with just dismay at Scotland, where we've got half of the country think we want independence. We've got half of the country think, no, 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 we want something else. And those two halves are kicking lumps out of each other constantly. And Scotland is somewhere in the middle, not not getting the the energy that it, we should be able to put into making it a better place. It's just I'm so fed up of being in this situation of not being independent because it just gets in wherever you turn. It's in the way. In that Denmark film, um, I mean, I say I haven't I haven't uh, seen it yet. Um, but Fiona was saying to me that it, like you you don't you don't talk much in terms of about about in, independence Scottish independence in it is that is that just quite a deliberate approach to yeah. take? Well, here's the shocker: I was a professional, award-winning BBC broadcaster for a quarter of a century. So surprise, surprise, what I turn out is actually not propaganda, if you like, but actually the sort of stuff the blinking public broadcaster should be doing. Yeah, so absolutely. are people in Scotland interested in how Denmark operates, it being one of our nearest neighbours and probably the most successful one and the same size country? I think so. Will it commission a documentary about Denmark? No. So, <laughs> you know, that's to me, that's what I'm answering. In, in every case, Norway, Iceland, all of them, they're not tub thumping about Scottish independence. They're saying, here's another small country, here's some of the story of how they do what they do with the kind of interviewees I would expect to have as a broadcaster um, asking them, you know, shaping it as a documentary, you then figure what you draw from it. And I think yeah. the aim is for it not to just be something that's available to yesers. But in all things, I have to say, I don't like being whacked out of the head with messages from stuff too much. And it's just, I think the most powerful thing is simply to tell stories and say, I don't mean stories as in makey uppies, but I mean, here is the story yeah. of how Denmark got to where it is today, as far as we're able to tell. Um, and you will do the rest. And that's the astonishing thing. The audience always does the rest. It's a, more, it's a very skillful approach in, in that way. And I mean, there was one years, it used to be, well, it is years back now. I, I went along to, um, oh, when was it? Clyde Bank. It was Clyde Bank um, Town Hall. And it was the Pharaoh's film. You were there. It's the same format. You were answering questions afterwards. And um, someone in either in the film or maybe you said it after the film, there was this phrase came up. Someone, a Pharaoh's person, had described Scotland as being a sleeping giant mm -hmm. and I I had a really big effect in me I mean a bit of me kind of went yeah we are giant but another bit of me was just kind of in parallel was just that sense of I don't know like sadness or loss or a kind of poignancy mm -hmm. about but why but why are we asleep because all our all our energies dissipate I mean from that sterling one that I went to and the, the audience there was definitely people in that audience who were not indie supporters you know there was was one of the people who asked a question declared himself as uh, part of the the empire didn't he but what was quite interesting after the event went round for a cup of tea at um, a friend's house and she'd invited a couple of people back who'd seen the movie and we were chatting away with them and i suddenly realized oh these people are not only are they not activists they're not even remotely interested in indie politics. And so we were having a completely different conversation to the one that I normally have with my friends. And I thought, this is quite an eye opener. And one of the things that really struck me was how little they knew about a lot of the stuff that goes on, even just stuff in, in Holyrood, you know, a lot of the the day to day politics of Scotland, they really didn't know much about it because they've got busy lives doing something else. 
but how open they were to have a discussion about some of these concepts that they were hearing. And it, it's exactly as you said, Marnie, it's not badged as independence. I think that's so clever. And wouldn't it be lovely if everybody who goes to see all these other 19 dates that you've got took a friend who wasn't an independent supporter with them yeah. and see yeah. what they made of yeah. it? Well, I did suggest that in the piece that the National had, uh, that, that that's the object of it, is take a friend who's sort of swithering or whatever. Because, I mean, the, I don't think there's anybody that's kind of come out and sort of said, gosh, that was a load of, you know, hectoring nonsense and I, a total waste of my time. I mean, it is about another country that I think most people are moderately interested in, really. It's nice of you to think that it's clever. It's the only way I would ever do something, and I feel quite strongly about this. I mean, everyone's got their different styles, but I, I hate being told what to think. I don't mm. like manipulated messages. I am not a post box. You know, I'm a sentient person who just wants to know more about how things work. And then I sort of draw my own conclusions, you know. So mm -hmm. in, in all of them, that is entirely how they are. And it's funny how it surprises me that people are surprised that there isn't some big, you know, moment where everybody waxes lyrical. Uh, but the people that we've interviewed, we sometimes ask what they know about Scotland. You know, quite a lot of them know nothing. Um, mm -hmm. In this film, like other films, there's always somebody who actually does know a wee bit. And it's when you've listened to them talking about their own country. I mean, that's the bit that, that nearly had me going in the film, um, where uh, the the newspaper editor just talks so kind of warmly about Scotland. Um, and keeps bringing it back in, talks about a future where the Nordics, you know, include Scotland in the way they organise and that Scotland's back in the European Union. And, you, you know, that does just about make you greet because you think yeah. this is not your battle, yeah. son, you know. Um, yeah. And the worth and value that other countries see us as having as, as potential members of the EU or partners or just people to kind of hang out with, basically, you know, a, a worthwhile nation. Um, yeah. That's what you yeah. get back from it when you're not trying to make them be part of your message, you know. So yeah. I hope that's what people get of it. Just talking about the Denmark one at the moment, was there anything that you could, that struck you as being something that, you know, ScotGov could actually start doing now, you know, before independence? Are there things that we could, you know, bring over, import over and, 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 and try and make happen here, like short of being independent? Everything. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, we have complete, okay, there's problems with expenditure, I'll give you that. Um, but, yeah, you know, everybody is doing kindergarten from, you know, either one or three to the age of six or seven. Um, we've got all sorts of, you know, some age groups get it, some don't, it's free. Um, most of the Nordic countries have an upper ceiling that's incredibly low. £200 a month in Norway is the most you can pay for kindergarten. It's incredible, right? But there is a contributory element that then makes it more affordable to do it, whereas we have everything free, um, and and it's limited then to you know certain cohorts. There's a clip in the film describing uh, the Danish attitude towards childcare costs. Quite a refreshing perspective. I pay about 37% uh, of my income in taxes and I'm really happy and I'm glad I'm doing it because it means I got the kindergarten, I got hospitals and anything I need provided. Is that the Danish way? Yes, we uh, all help each other so that everybody gets the possibility to go to kindergarten. You also have families who don't have that much money and then by us paying taxes we actually help them getting a cheaper or more discount in the daycare and some of them even go freely to daycare they don't have to pay uh, yeah. but the, the revolution you get when kids are getting you know that level of immersion and engaged play for about five years at the start of their lives absolutely indispensable and we could be we could be doing that or getting close to it the education setup mind-blowing um just when we're You'd have to get over the sort of judgmentalism of the British testing, testing, testing system, which I'm afraid I think Nicola Sturgeon didn't, uh, so that she still had put in testing of five-year-olds. I think we're the only country in Europe that tests five-year-olds in admittedly small, but nonetheless, any way at all. Um, Finland, for example, doesn't have any external tests of its kids till the age of 15. So in, in Denmark at 15, just when all the pressure's coming on in Britain, 
um, you know, to succeed through competition, through being scared, through the motivation of losing everything if you don't make the right choices. At that point, Denmark goes, hmm, I think the kids need a break. And, and the kids can go off to, to an after school uh, where they can basically still do their academic stuff, but also study the, something they really love for a year with other 15 year olds away from their parents. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Who would not oh, go? Who would not go? Yeah. That was one of the things that really struck me because my son hated school. And at that point, when he was starting to get himself in a real state about what he was going to do, and he ended up leaving school and, and having to go back in through education later through the open university to get qualifications in order to go to university. Horrible, horrible, stressful time. That environment that you saw. I thought he would have thrived in that. And I, again, I'm furious that we don't have <laughs> that available to us yeah. in this country. Sounds like it's a lot different over in Denmark. I think we're, uh, we're happy, but we're also very self-focused. Uh, and we try to use this year to show that now, now you're part of a, of a fellowship. Um, this is the strength of a fellowship. You give and you take. Some give more because they're wider shoulders right now or being a better place in life. And then you give more to, to, to the community uh, and then the, you get back. So you, you, there's ups and downs in life. And the ups and downs this year. Um, so I think that's that's also the, one of the big values of being in an F school. One of the other little bits that has stayed with me was the kindergarten kids and there was a little quick shot of they're playing outside and they've got sort of a wooden sawhorse they've all got a real saw in their hand these two it's about two three years old and they're sawing through a log and i thought can you imagine the level of health and safety we'd put round that they'd all be wrapped up in bubble wrap with plastic saws and 10 supervisors when i asked that that uh, the kindergarten manager what you know what the kids got mostly out of playing outdoors. She said, experience. Yes. <laughs> right. That's it. So the, the converse of that is no experience. So what we're giving our children is no experience, no touching, mm -hmm. no smelling, no getting close to the edge of something that's a bit dodgy, just none of that, you know? Um, so yeah, there's all of that. And to be fair, there's been a bit of a push in Scotland to make an advance. Upstart's a great group that has pushed this Sue Palmer for some years, and we have got yeah. a better way along. There's more outdoor kindergarten. But I think that's where the after school or the 15 year old's little moment of break is so important because yeah. at that stage it's begun to build up again the pressure. And every time it builds up, they build it back down. But you know, what you get across the piece is just um, they build in cooperation. You don't mm -hmm. get cooperation by just sort of, you know, singing Kumbaya. You get it by c encouraging the kids for a year. They live away from home. They cook together. They take care of one another. They take responsibility for one another's problems and lives. And they come back as young adults. Everybody told us that. So, yes. you know, worth its weight in gold. And actually, um, I spoke about this at the Edinburgh Book Festival last summer, and uh, Jenny Gilruth, who's the education minister, was in the audience. And she came up and said at the end, I'd really like to speak to you about this system when you come back. I have tried to make contact with her, but ministers are not the easiest people to kind of get hold of. And to be fair, she's, she's you know, she does have her hands full. But this is the trouble. You always have your hands full just keeping the show on the road. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to have the kind of... I don't know, the ability to stand back and sort of reframe what you're doing, that does take quite something, you know, and across the piece, all of these things are there to be done. I mean, the other thing to highlight is the little island of Samso, which has district heating, <laughs> um, which basically cut its prices last year when our prices trebled. Yeah, just because they decided to do, to do it for themselves, wasn't it? Well, Yes and no. I mean, the just in that is sort of like implies that it, there's a lot that that rests upon. I mean, first of all, it rests upon the fact that they are a tiny municipality of 3,700 people. So basically, there was nobody telling them from the mainland, face south, face anywhere else, you can't. Mm -hmm. 
come up with an idea, go to literally their local town hall 10 minutes away on the bike, have a discussion about it. They knew who they were dealing with already. You know, all of that made that easier to get off the ground, in fact, possible to get off the ground. And when I spoke to Soren Hermanson, who's one of my heroes, who um, was really the pioneer of a lot of this stuff, he, he actually said, if we'd been part of a larger mainland uh, council, this would not have happened. Mm. So to say they just did it, yeah, but there's there's the kind of, with all the things in the Nordics, there are fundamental structural things which we don't have. So it's a bit like, you know, they've already thrown six, so they're skipping around the Ludo board. We're, you know, throwing high, but we ain't throw six yet. So we're mm. still not started because we haven't got local control. We haven't got widespread land ownership. We haven't got sort of, the, you know, these beneficial habits of smallness about the place. We have quangos that, you know, still prefer the lowest bidder from wherever they, wherever they come from. We've got so many things built in that make the air towards us not being Denmark. Mm. Yeah. There's another grouping on the go that wants to use this 25th year of the Scottish Parliament to basically have a bit of a kind of um, MOT and to, to say... There were a lot of promises made about improved democracy uh, when the parliament came in. And, you know, some of them have come to fruition, but some of them, particularly this decentralization, never happened. And it's gone in the opposite direction. Are you optimistic, Leslie, about changes, you know, changes like the ones you've just been mentioning being able to happen? I mean, what, you know, pre-independence or post-independence, are you basically optimistic about things? I am basically optimistic. That's it. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I wouldn't be doing anything that I'm doing. I mean, I, I would say I'm sort of basically optimistic, possibly naive and curious. And that yeah, makes yeah. me going through an awful lot of things. So I, I think most of the people I meet are pretty much the same, actually. You know, most people, I think, uh, on the yes side are really quite able to look at other countries and think, yeah, we could learn things from other countries. It's astonishing how... Um, angry unionist commentators get online at the mere mention mm -hmm. of other countries you know as if yeah i mean clearly all in the boat is not garden is not rosy in britain and you're not going to find other uh, other systems that are more than just incrementally better unless you start looking at countries that are doing a whole lot better and actually by definition they will actually be very different. So in coming back to Fiona's thing about feeling slightly sort of sad about everything, it's a bit like you climbed the wrong mountain. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like at the beginning, it didn't look like too different a path, but actually you end up on just a completely different place than you expected. We've put a lot of energy into systems that are fundamentally so sort of elitist that they don't really get the, change and transformation that you're looking for so I, I really really fiddling around with stuff now i appreciate if you're in government you just need to keep the show on the road but we're throwing good money after bad in so many respects now and we're not willing to we'll listen to other people's ideas but sort of go mm, that works for them but we're weird you can't have that in a country that's considering independence you can't have people who think yeah, all these other countries can do local control and stuff like that, but for reasons we cannot put our finger on, Scotland can't do it. Because we'll yeah. never become independent if we think that privately. It's not true that we're incapable. It's that we have not currently got leadership that's breaking this into manageable chunks, if you like. I mean, mm -hmm. back in the 1940s, my mother's family, who lived in Caithness, had no electricity. You know, there was electricity in small villages in Arctic Norway from 1892 because they used hydroelectricity that we couldn't get because the rivers were owned by Lairds and the coast was owned by the Crown Estate Commission. So, you know, we didn't get, my mother's family didn't get a blooming electric light until 1944 after Tom Johnson intervened and, and created the hydro board. Now, that's what I call government. That's a big step forward. And it was inconceivable at the time that this could happen because the landowners wouldn't let their land be used for hydro. 
So we need that level of big, ambitious planning clout. And this was within a UK with no blinking Scottish Parliament. So, you yeah. know, we need yeah. some ambitious stuff going to get ourselves out of the rut and to encourage ourselves to think that we can make changes, you know, like yeah. this. Indeed. It's another thing that was in the film, and I think you actually made the point that it's not that Denmark has no problems at all. You know, it does have issues with immigration an issue that it's tackling with you know, various other things. But what they're not doing is sitting there going, well, that's it. We can't do it then. You know, we better get we better get somebody else to do it for us. It's that confidence, I think, that you can actually tackle the problems because you as a country, you as a nation need to tackle them. Um, and that's where we seem to struggle. I mean, when you look, I mean, I'm currently reading quite a lot of books. I don't know if it's sitting here. It's nearly always with me at the moment. A book about Danish history, which is fascinating. And um, I mean, these these guys in about 18, 1815 was a big uh, 14 was a big year for them in lots of respects. Denmark lost Norway, which was big. Um, and you think that would be what it's remembered most for. But it was also the year that farmers uh, became independent. And that's how it's described. Um, they, they were no longer essentially acting in any surf-like way for landowners. Mm -hmm. um, and there was plenty of reforms done in 1814 that really transformed Denmark so that you know, its people became very independent minded, uh, very able to own, you know, to, to be feel secure enough to kind of shape their country. And that seems to have been a period from which they drove forward. Um, so that you sort of, you know, again, there you've got, a, you know, there's another wee problem there because I think people underestimate the degree to which not actually, you know, having having somebody in the background who until 20 years ago was your feudal superior, it's unbelievable that it took us so long to abolish feudalism and yeah. it's sitting there somewhere that, you know, there's some reason you can't quite do something and it takes a long time for that kind of hesitation to work its way out of the system. Um, so there's, there's too much feudalism still. In, if feudalism is the business of having a hierarchy of control sitting somewhere behind your lug, that's not gone because it's still there in who owns the land and it's still yeah. there in terms of massive regional councils who you don't know, who basically still micromanage a community they will never visit, which is your yeah. hope. Yeah. So all of that is not good. Uh, Marlene and I were at several events. I think you were at some of them as well. We probably passed you in the corridors. There was the Revive Conference. There was the Festival of Survival. There was the Breakup of Britain. There was Our Star in Europe. They were all based around issues. They weren't based, they weren't independence badged events, although I imagine a lot of the audience might well have been indie supporters. That wasn't why we were there. And we were just wondering if this is a start of a shift from instead of us going out there campaigning, saying we want independence, full stop. All those issues, independence kind of floated up from the discussion as the answer or not being independent floated up as the barrier. Uh, and uh, we were wondering if that actually is the way we should be um, focusing going forward? Is it more productive to start thinking about solving specific issues that face us all? And whether that actually might be a way that independence kind of gets woven into the solution. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, yes, I think. I mean, funnily enough, I've just been having that conversation uh, with some of the guys in the Scottish Independence Foundation about another idea, which is basically to, to almost have... Um, a kind of summer school so that people can immerse themselves in Scottish culture because yeah. so many of us know a little bit about where we live but nothing about really international figures that you know come from other parts of Scotland about you know things that are, are astonishing about Scotland when I was writing Thrive I got very drawn into the astonishing geology of Scotland even if you want to get to that mm -hmm. traveled country almost in the world uh, really yeah. Who knew, you know? So um, the Irish have long had summer schools and these are people who, uh, you know, have got, well, they actually consciously set up. The uh, the GAA was a, a construct to try to promote Gaelic culture within sport. Um, they've obviously got a whole massive uh, kind of literature. They've got a lot going for them already. And then they created summer schools to make sure that each generation kind of fastened on to the greats. 
Yeah. And in Scotland, we don't have any of that. We play football, we play, we don't have, but you know, there's, there is now, there is shinty, there is curling and so on, but it's very largely seen as a sort of highland cute kind of exception to the rule. Um, and we are not kind of consolidating our culture by any efforts other than school or whatever. Mm -hmm. We did a show actually, and we've got a series on Independence Live called Mibby's Eye. It's every month we do a video on for, for people who might be still making up their mind. And back in the summer, we covered a performance and it was a, an events management student who was doing it as part of her final year based on the idea of the National Collective. And she just went out to anybody she knew, said, come and do this event. And this event went on in Edinburgh in an afternoon and she had poets, she had people reading excerpts from their novels, she had young folk who've got a play on in Glasgow, they got a group of girls who've got something on at the, the comedy festival, all came along for free and it was a wonderful event and we were sitting there thinking this is this is what it's all about, this is where the energy is, this is where the young people are, the audience was full of young folk for a change. Um, the person who put that together, she's Australian, you know she had to come over here and go huh they're not doing X, I'll have a go at it. And okay, yeah, that, but if you want to look at it that way, I'm Irish, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or English or something. I mean, I was born in Wolverhampton, I have no idea why. Mm. But, you know, so my parents are kind of very Scottish, but I think if you come from somewhere else, you do kind of come in and go, for fuck's sake, these people have got a lot going for them. And you don't have so much of the sort of inbuilt cringe. I mean, I've yeah. got enough of it to basically understand its power. But, um, yeah, you know, there's th it, mostly going around the Nordic countries makes me realize the wealth of cultural stuff we've got here. And when you speak to people in other countries, you realize, oh gosh, it's just unbelievable, actually. I mean, what, every different dimension. And yeah, I mean, we're all quietly getting on with it. It doesn't necessarily, you know, different forms of music don't get that much backing and yet on they go and Celtic Connections showcases that every year. Thank God for people like Donald Shaw and all the folk who've put their lives into supporting um, that kind of traditional music. It's just one corner of what we've got. But I'm really sort of suggesting we have a summer school event like a music festival. You get a long weekend. It's scheduled with music in the evening. It's possibly co-scheduled with one older day, one younger day, when the younger ones say, well, here's what we think Scottish culture is, you'll, you know. Um, and it would be, I think, a very interesting thing to suddenly get what is the greats of our culture, you know, because otherwise if we're not going to showcase them, I don't know what will. So coming back to your point, I think all of this, you know, Ireland had a cultural revolution as well as a political one. And perhaps because we've been very focused on a parliamentary process, we've sort of left the rest of that a little bit um, out. So that probably is a very good place to be putting energy at the moment. Yeah. yeah. Have you got plans to do any more of these films? I mean, we, Fiona and I were chatting beforehand when we were both going, Ireland, you need to do Ireland. Mm. Uh, no, <laughs> because I mean, this is taking lumps out of me. Everything that you see um, is the product of an awful lot of time and, and stuff. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Actually, apart from anything else, as you will well know, you gals, emotional energy. You know, the, if you, to, to believe that something can be done, that it can be good, that you will get interviewees, that you will go over and it won't be disastrous, that you can get a film schedule, that everything will roughly work, that nothing will go wrong with you health-wise in the middle of it, that you will get back, that it will get edited, that it will have, have a shape because at the beginning you can't be sure, yeah, will yeah. then appeal to audiences that you can persuade cinemas to take it on, that all of that can be done. That's six months work yeah. easily for nothing. Yeah. So, you know, it's kind of like, it's an easy thing to say, yeah, or it just bounce on to do the next thing. Um, and it's nice that people have that <laughs> expectation. Um, Ireland, it, it, Ireland's difficult in a way because people half know that story you know, a lot of the Irish history has been hyper told. The beauty of the Nordics, in a way, is like, who knew anything about Estonia? I knew hee haw, you know, I True, didn't know yeah. was the map. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit of a different thing. People have also talked about Scotland, uh, you know, which again, it's strangely, is more difficult because we know we live here and know so much about it. Um, but there's, there's definitely, you know, uh, thoughts bubble up 
Um, at the moment, I'm just very interested in this cultural aspect of things um, yeah. because it feels like, you know, some of the the custodians of, of a very sort of special culture, many of them are dying. And it just feels like, you know, we just need to do something about this, actually, before we've lost those, the, the carrying stream, as Hamish Henderson used to speak about it. Again, someone that people will recognize the name and know very little about, you know. Right now, we've also got, as well as you, um, with your very punishing schedule <laughs> of um, of promotion that you're doing for the film, I mean, looking at, you've got, what, two months worth of something on every couple of days all over the country. That must be quite a, take quite a toll on you um, from your energy. And we've also got the other one, the To See Ourselves movie that um, Jay McAllister did. How much easier would it be to promote some of this kind of stuff if we had a slightly more joined up independence media because we're all so fragmented we're all doing our own little bit and if you look across the piece you've got broadcasters live streamers you've got i scott magazine you've got orkney news you've got the national you've got us you've got various other podcasters not least yourself and i, I just wonder if if there's something that we could do that kind of coordinated that a little so that if you come, you've got, here's my new movie, and we all go, right, we swing into action. Everybody's sort of, you know, there's a press release goes out. It goes out to the massed indie media. I'm just making this up as I'm talking. It's kind of coming, but I just kind of feel it, we're all out there. Is that something? Could we be amplifying each other's voices more We certainly could be amplifying each other's voices a lot more mm -hmm. than a lot more than happens. I mean, it happens mm -hmm. a little bit, doesn't it? Like on, on Twitter, say, but Twitter's such an ephemeral thing. You know, a tweet happens and it's not around really. But it, it, there is a bit of that goes on. But yeah. Maybe we should, you and I should keep thinking about that, Fiona. Well, I think your summer school, maybe we do a session for the indie media. I mean, sure, all of that, that is a great idea. But but the thing that I've realised through this film particularly is that, as I said, although I, I was employed, you know, by the dreaded corporation for 25 years, you know, as a professional broadcaster, um, I have completely given up on any expectation of of, if you like, support for... A, a product that could easily be on any channel, you know, um, mm. I'm completely not expecting any help at all. No help just from distribution, no help to fund it, n no no expectation it would get commissioned. Um, because therein lies madness. You spend time trying to get something commissioned, it's not going to happen. It just delays you and you get depressed. But now I'm sort of, and some people who, you know, are more broad-minded people within some of these organizations have basically said, you could have got help with this. So I think the next thing is to actually think, why are we operating in a sort of parallel sort of universe where it's like our guilty little secret that we're doing here, when actually mm -hmm. this is perfectly kosher stuff for the entire population of Scotland, you know? So I think that's what I'm going to try and think the next time round. I don't think it's actually going to ever come to a commission with the BBC. And actually, um, you get more people watching this way than the Beeb commissioning something, putting it on at 11 o'clock at night and yeah. 3,000 people watch it on the BBC Scotland channel. Yeah. Times are changing. YouTube is a great channel. And, it, and just to answer a point that came in earlier, um, the whole th the film will be on YouTube after it's gone through the cinemas because a lot of them are concerned to that they yeah. think that if people are watching it on YouTube yeah. they won't come to the cinema. So yeah. fundamentally, it won't go online until after the last screening in the cameo, which is March the twenty eighth. So it's a wee bit yeah. of a wait, but that way round, at least hopefully, it pumps up the volume for the cinema screenings. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, though, that, you know, it, people are concerned over something that they think if it's independence, then it's political and they're not sure if they can use it in mainstream cinema. But they've got no qualms about broadcasting the bloody coronation or something else that's swathed in Union Jacks. It's equally political and yeah. equally disagreed with by half of the, the country. Yeah, that's true. But as you say, from having seen it, this is not a political film. No. But and yet. The, the mere act of looking at how a neighboring small country operates is a nationalist act. Mm -hmm. In the eyes of broadcasters, that's what the, we've come to. You know, I've just seen that and just thought, okay. But now I'm sort of thinking there's enough people in there who are beginning within their own organizations to say, this is crazy, man, you know? So maybe there's more of a fuss to be made.
Yeah. It might occur to someone at uh, you know BBC Scotland that if they did more of that, then their their listenership and viewership numbers might go might go up a wee bit yeah. again because they must be noticing that they're pretty far down. Yeah. Well, best of luck for the rest of the <laughs> schedule. Um, be really interesting to see what kind of re a response you get. I'm sure it's going to be as positive as the ones yeah. you've seen already because it's a fabulous film. I thoroughly enjoyed watching it, and you know, it's not many people make me cry these days, but it it really, <laughs> you know, it did. <laughs> yeah, and hope you've got hope you've got a few days off and schedule between them that you can just go home and relax. And but really, I I totally love going around. School. Probably it's because the template was there from when I was young. We used to come across from Belfast to go to my grandparents in Wick and went got there in one day, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> before oh. the line was dueled, before there were bridges <laughs> were the first above Inverness. <laughs> so to me, all of these are little trips, you know, because that was like a one trip. So I, I love going around and seeing people and getting the crack and all that sort of stuff. It just obviously it takes a bit of time, um, but yeah. people are so generous. They take care of you. They worry about you know they it's it's a sweet it's so so lovely so no there's no pain there it's just that it does take up a lot of it your does take time yeah so you can't do yeah. five million things at once but you can do probably five and thank you so much for this because all of this helps and you gals are also testimony to that sort of you know cussed determination to keep <laughs> oh, yeah. optimism things. That was a really good discussion. I really enjoyed that. I mean, uh, Leslie's enthusiasm is just infectious, isn't it, when she's talking it is, about it the, is. the it is indeed. And a lot of work that she's that she's put into this. I am looking forward to seeing it. Let's put up the links. If you go to her website, you'll get details of all the upcoming places that you can go and watch a film, join in the question and answer with her afterwards. Take a friend as well. Take yes. somebody who's maybe not an indie supporter yet yes. and just get involved in a conversation because there's less he said it's not a political film it's an inspirational film about the kind of country we could be right? okay so thanks to leslie for coming and joining us and we'll catch you all later bye bye now